Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Anna Savage. I am a uh, associate professor just recently promoted to associate professor in the Department of Biology here at UCF. Um, and I'm here to give you my distinguished speaker seminar series presentation, which unfortunately was canceled back in April due to COVID-19. Uh, but we felt like the topic was was something that would be of interest, especially right now, um, given that we are dealing with a global pandemic and my research deals with wildlife uh, disease epidemics. And so I'm here to give you a virtual version of that presentation. So it's sad that I, I can't interact with any of you in person, but I hope that this is something that you can virtually enjoy at your leisure. Um, and so I have a PowerPoint presentation I'm going to, to give to you as I record here from my, my home office in Oviedo, Florida. Um, before I, I pull that up, I just wanted to make sure that I thanked the distinguished speaker series organizers who have been fantastic all along in terms of helping to create these presentations. And even with the uh, COVID-19 situation, they've been fantastic in terms of helping me convert this into a virtual version. So I'm gonna go ahead uh, as I do with all my Zoom lectures, as I think many of you are probably familiar with, and I'm going to share my screen so that we can actually uh, see the PowerPoint presentation and so that you can uh, see me and follow along with, with the presentation. Uh, so my talk is titled On the Brink, Understanding Wildlife Disease Epidemics, uh, because that's really the focus of my research, uh, targeting species that are arguably on the brink of extinction and looking at those cases where disease is the thing that is, is potentially driving those extinctions and causing problems. And so um, this is an area that's very near and dear to my heart and I think has become more and more relevant to all of us given the, the current situation. Um, so I wanted to, uh, to break my talk down into a format that I hope would sort of recreate what, what the Distinguished Speaker series was intended to be. So I know normally we'd be at a country club, it would be six o'clock, you would be eating a nice you know, three course menu of delicious food. And so I've decided to organize my talk into uh, three courses of an appetizer, main course and dessert, where I'm gonna start out by hopefully whetting your appetite by talking about wildlife diseases in general and how this is relevant to our current global pandemic. Um, then I'll move on to the main course and tell you a bit of detail about my research specifically focusing on the amphibian disease crisis. And then finally, moving on to dessert, we'll finish by talking kind of about some of the data-driven takeaways that uh, can get us towards hopefully a better understanding of how we should address and mitigate these disease concerns, both for human health and for wildlife health. Um, oh, and sorry, I'm having Zoom issues already. There we go. Okay. so. So emerging infectious diseases in wildlife is the focus of my research, and this is a growing field of research in general. And so what I'm showing you here on the slide are just highlighting a few of the many, many, many examples of pathogen-driven disease in wildlife. So uh, disease is a natural phenomenon. Uh, you know, there are predators, there are parasites, there are pathogens. This is just part of what natural ecosystems and non-natural ecosystems look like. And so uh, this is something that is not necessarily concerning just because you see any kind of wildlife disease happening. But the cases that I'm talking about here and kind of highlighting with some of these pictures are the more extreme examples where we're not just seeing disease outbreaks and some level of decline, but we're actually seeing massive, in some cases, global increases in disease that are leading to population and species extinctions. And so just to highlight a few of the examples here down in the bottom, we've got Tasmanian devil facial tumor disease, which is a disease that is actually caused by a transmissible 
cancer is a cancer line that originated in one Tasmanian devil and it was able to be transmitted from devil to devil and it nearly caused the species to go extinct um, only because of very excellent research and conservation actions has there been a recovery of that species. Um, some other examples that we still really haven't figured out are things like colony collapse disorder, which is linked to a number of different environment and pathogen factors. Uh, we have coral bleaching disease, which is a problem for our oceans worldwide. Um, we do understand some of the roles that certain fungal pathogens play in that system, but there are also a lot of uh, environmental factors as well. Sea star wasting disease, chronic wasting disease in deer, the list goes on and on. I could spend hours just telling you about all of the cases. Um, but the, the point more generally is that this is a become a more important area of research because we are seeing so many new diseases emerge. So before I get any further, I just want to address the, the elephant in the Zoom room, so to speak, which is that we're in the midst of a global pandemic that is a disease that was introduced to humans from wildlife. So this is what we call a zoonotic disease. COVID-19 absolutely came to us through wildlife uh, transmission. And so I think, uh, whereas in the past, I would have had to make an argument for why we human beings in general should care about wildlife disease, I don't think I really need to make that argument. Um, I think we are all highly aware right now of the fact that these wildlife diseases are things that can direct, directly threaten human health. And so that's one of the reasons why I think it's very timely to kind of talk to you about this research area. So uh, I suspect that many, if not all of you are very familiar with all of the information about COVID-19. It's something we're all paying a lot of attention to, but um, just, just to make sure we're all on the same page, I just wanted to touch a little bit specifically about the wildlife origins of COVID-19. So. It's a disease caused by a uh, newly emerged coronavirus that's officially now been uh, named SARS-CoV-2. And it emerged in Wuhan, China back in December of 2019. The first uh, people who developed these pneumonia-like symptoms that we now know to be COVID-19 uh, are, we're all linked to having recently been at a specific wet market in Wuhan, China. And so we think that that is the likely place where this disease transmission event occurred. So you're seeing a picture of a typical wet market. This is a place where there are a number of very different uh, wildlife taxa, you know, from mammals to reptiles, all different types of organisms are brought here, slaughtered, sold. And it's a place where both humans are coming into contact with the blood of a lot of different wildlife organisms, but also those wildlife animals are interacting with each other. And so it's kind of a perfect environment for any pathogens that are able to jump from one host species to the next to do so. So we do think that that is how this specific transmission event happened. Um, so the specific organism that we know this coronavirus came from are bats. And this is actually not surprising at all because bat coronaviruses also caused the previous human SARS and MERS disease outbreaks back in the 2000s. So there are two other huge disease uh, zoonotic uh, events that are linked to coronaviruses. And I actually wanted to call out one particular paper. There's actually several of them, but, th but this one in particular kind of highlights what I wanna focus on, which is that um, this is something that uh, scientists who study bat coronaviruses have been warning about for decades. So back in 2007, this paper in the journal Emerging Infectious Diseases warned specifically about this group of bat coronaviruses, this particular lineage of these viruses, that it was particularly able to cause a human pandemic. And so just, uh, I'd encourage you to read the whole paragraph, but the, the area highlighted in the box they highlight that the ability of these SARS-like coronaviruses to be really easily transmitted between different species is really consistent actually with a bunch of other coronaviruses. And this has previously been demonstrated to happen in different livestock species. And this group of coronaviruses is also has been for decades included in the group of viruses likely to be responsible for emerging zoonoses. They were put in that group even before SARS happened. And so, I guess this is my call to uh, highlight the primary literature and that although 
Um, sometimes we feel that it doesn't get uh, very widely read by the general public. It's really important to look at these resources in terms of those who have been studying these different groups of wildlife diseases. Um, and it can give us a lot of insight into what are really the big threats for humans. So human coronavirus outbreaks, the three big ones that have happened so far, originate in bats, but there's also different wildlife species that act as intermediate hosts. So it's not just as simple as a bat directly transmitting into humans. In fact, um, in this recent review paper, they had this kind of nice infographic highlighting that uh, when the MERS outbreak happened, it was it, camels that were actually the intermediate host. It was a civet cat when it came to SARS, original recipe SARS, and that now that we're in SARS-2, the current pandemic, we don't know for sure, this is a very active area of research, but it was likely a pangolin based on genetic comparisons, um, certainly some additional mammal species. And so what I wanna highlight here is that it's specifically this situation where you have humans and multiple different wildlife species all coming into close contact that enables these new disease uh, host switches to occur. So I think that the, the COVID-19 pandemic really reinforces the importance of a concept that's been out there for a few decades that we call One Health. And One Health is typically represented by the Venn diagram that you can see. It's simply highlighting that there is an interconnectivity between human health, environmental health, and animal health. And so One Health is saying that if we really want to make sure that we're promoting good human health, we also have to promote and be aware of the threats to environmental health and animal health. And so when we have a, a human global pandemic that is linked to uh, wildlife disease, this is a classic example of how our own health is dramatically being influenced by these other factors. And this is a concept that, um, a lot of intelligent people are thinking about now in terms of COVID-19 specifically. So I, I pulled this figure from a recent publication just from the last couple of months, revisiting the One Health approach uh, in the context of COVID-19. And so what uh, disease ecologists and epidemiologists are thinking about right now is specifically what are those environmental factors and what are those different uh, wildlife organisms and factors that are all contributing to these situations where we have things like COVID-19 emerging as a global pandemic. So with that introduction that hopefully gets you intrigued about what's going on specifically with wildlife diseases and uh, what we can understand about wildlife disease and then relate to human disease, uh, I want to move on to the main, the main course, which really deals with a very different group of organisms and a very different type of pathogens, um, but has a lot of par parallels to what's going on with, with COVID-19. So I want to tell you about my research on the amphibian disease crisis specifically. So um, as my family likes to say, I am a frogologist. Um, more formally, we, we say, we use the term herpetology to mean those that study reptiles and amphibians, but I'm happy, happy with the term frogologist because it's actually really been my lifelong passion. So you can see a picture of me back in 1990 in rural New Hampshire where I grew up. Um, and it's a characteristic picture of me with a couple of frogs in my hand. It's really what I spent a, a huge portion of my childhood uh, focused on, especially because I was homeschooled and had a lot of time and ability to just roam around and focus on the things that I enjoyed, which was really frogs. Um, this is something that has continued on to this day. So as I became interested in becoming a scientist and doing genetics research, I kind of merged those two path passions by studying genetics of frogs. And this is something that I still in my free time like to go out and catch frogs and have just started introducing them to my daughter. So. Um, just in case any of you aren't convinced from one picture, this, this frogologist thing has really been a defining feature of, of my life. Um, and so if you look at pretty much any photo of me uh, from childhood, I either have a frog on my head, on my shirt, or in my hands. In addition to that, um, from documents from my homeschooling that my mother has saved for many decades, uh, you can see that I wrote a lot of research reports about frogs. Uh, I had a, a comic series called The Frog Pond, 
that did not consist of anything you could really reasonably call jokes, um, but I really thought it did at the time. Um, I also had a book and movie review system where I would rate everything on a series of four frogs to no frogs. And so really you could say that every part of my life has been, been dominated by this, this passion for frogs. Um, and there's also a really other important dimension to why I made frogology my career choice. And that is that back in 1990, when I was out playing with frogs every day, there was something else going on in the research community that I wasn't even aware of that was extremely important, which is that amphibian biologists got together in 1990 and published a paper in the journal Science called Where Have All the Frog Froggies Gone? And they published this paper as a real call to action because it had been a decade of biologists getting together and trying to figure out what was going on because all of their study amphibians in these very pristine areas that had not been destroyed in any way, um, they had just suddenly disappeared. And so it was this big mystery of what is going on with amphibians all over the world that they're just disappearing. And so this sparked the, you know, several decades of really intensive research to kind of get answers to what was going on. And at this point, we have looked at a bunch of different uh, possible threats. We've looked at amphibian deformities. Uh, you can see some extra limbs is kind of a common phenomenon we see linked to some amphibian uh, declines. Uh, we've looked at a number of pathogens and really at present what we are hypothesizing might be going on is that this could be a harbinger of the sixth mass extinction of biodiversity on planet earth. That's the scale of this problem. And so one particular disease has emerged that seems to be the far and away leading cause of global amphibian de declines. And it's a disease that's called chytridiomycosis. And so that's gonna be the focus of what I talk about today. Um, I could endlessly tell you about the really fantastic body of research looking at every single angle of this pathogen, its ecology, et cetera. But to try to kind of focus on the most important factors, especially for the work that I'm gonna tell you about, this is a global disease. It is a problem for amphibians on every continent where they occur, which is everywhere except for Antarctica. Um, it has recently emerged. So it was 1990 that we realized there was a problem, but that was because in the 70s and 80s is when all the frogs were really disappearing. So this is something that around the 1970s uh, spread globally. It is very specific to amphibians. And so it is a fungal disease that uh, can cause uh, rapid declines and extinctions in uh, salamanders and frogs and Sicilians, the three amphibian groups, but not in any other organism. Um, it's caused by a fungus that I'll tell you more about in a moment. One of the features that I find so remarkable and interesting from a research perspective about this disease is that sometimes it causes an entire frog species to go extinct. Done. They're gone. And in other cases, it actually seems to be benign or at least very minimally problematic where you see widespread infection but the species is doing just fine and so what i'm really interested in is what is driving that difference in susceptibility from one frog to the other so the specific fungus that causes chytridiomycosis is uh what we call Batrachochytrium dendrobatitis which we just call bd for short because it's really a mouthful and so bd is a single celled microscopic fungus it's not something that you would see growing anywhere it is uh only something that you can view under a high power microscope and so what you're seeing here in purple is some amphibian skin. It's the skin of a leopard frog. And this is a fungus that can actually only infect the skin and no other tissue of a frog. And so what you're seeing here in terms of these big purple blobs that some of the arrows are pointing to is that's just the nucleus of the host cell. So those are just the skin cells of the frog. In contrast, when you see these little round, dark, very circular balls, or a white open spot, that's either a BD cell or the white spots are where there was a BD cell that insisted into the skin, asexually reproduced and produced zoospores, which are these aquatic spores that have a little tail, almost look like a little sperm or something like that. And 
they have the tail because they're, they are free living and free swimming in water. So once a BD cell colonizes the skin, it does this, this asexual reproduction all on its own, and then it releases all of these zoospores, and those zoospores can go out and live in any water body and go infect other frogs, or it can actually just go and recolonize that same individual. So because it has this free living aquatic phase in the water, that's part of why this disease is so readily spread throughout ecosystems and so hard to contain. So uh, I mentioned before that, that chytridiomycosis is the disease that we think is really responsible for the majority of this amphibian decline crisis. In fact, there was just last year a paper published that really quantified this um, and was able to in fact say that if we look at the tree of life of amphibians, which you're seeing in this circle here, where the warm colors are show, showing you the most severe decline. So red means extinct and yellow means to almost totally wiped out. And then blue means they're doing okay. I wanna highlight a few things. First of all, look at the species diversity of amphibians. So we uh, have over 8,000 amphibian species and counting on this planet. Um, if we look at different lineages of frogs, you see there's red and yellow all throughout. So this is not particular to any one group. Chytridiomycosis is affecting a lot of different species. And you can see that there are hundreds to thousands of species that are severely affected by this disease. So this is in fact the greatest recorded loss of biodiversity ever attributable to any disease on planet Earth. So this leads to me and my own research program, right? So because I had this very strong interest in genetics and in amphibians, and I realized there was this disease crisis going on, I made that the focus of my dissertation research. So I, I got my PhD at Cornell University, um, uh, where I studied the genetics of chytridiomycosis in a species of leopard frog that occurs in the southwestern U.S., uh, specifically out in Arizona. So I spent a lot of time out in the desert, out in the western United States, catching these small little stream frogs and doing a series of detailed field and lab experiments, and that's really what's kicked off my, my research program ever since, and it's something that I've maintained to this day. Um, now, in terms of my lab here at UCF in general, uh, it's not all just about frogs and BD. Um, what I say is that more generally, we all study the disease triangle. So we work on a number of different organisms. You can see some of them in the pictures here. Um, we have projects looking at sea turtles, looking at gopher tortoises, looking at a lot of different frog species. And the common thread is that we're all interested in understanding what are the causes and consequences of infectious diseases? And in order to do that, we need to look at this disease triangle, meaning you need to look at the hosts, you need to look at those pathogenic organisms, and then you also need to look at the environment, which makes up the triad of the different factors that are influencing disease. And so specifically with my chytridiomycosis research, the main question that I've focused on here at UCF is trying to understand why there's so much variation in susceptibility to BD across species. Why do some frogs die of this disease and other frogs seem to be mostly fine? So I'm representing this with a scale on this slide where you can see things uh, ranging on the dark side to 100% susceptible, meaning that species is gonna get wiped out if it gets infected all the way to 100% resistant, meaning those frogs can get exposed again and again, and it's not really gonna do anything to them. And what we see is that among the different frog species that I've been studying, they fall everywhere along this range from the two extreme ends of the spectrum to right in the middle to kind of somewhere a little bit more on one side or the other. And the big question that I'm asking is what causes those differences in disease susceptibility? And so what I'm gonna do is just quickly go through three examples of some of the recent and ongoing research that uh, I and my graduate and undergraduate students have been doing, trying to ad address this broad question by looking at different species that fall in different places on this spectrum. And the first example I'm gonna tell you about is where we're asking this question on the resistant side of this spectrum. Is chytridiomycosis, this disease caused by BD, a problem right here in the southeastern United States? So when I first came to UCF, I had not been working in this part of the world at all. I've been working in the Southwest and other parts of the world. And so it was a region where we really hadn't been studying this disease. And there was very little understanding of 
whether it was really present and if it was present, whether it was really impacting frog species. It's not a place where we were seeing those obvious catastrophic declines that had been documented for decades. And so what we started doing is using a uh, molecular diagnostic technique where we basically are able to uh, look at the genome of this BD pathogen and measure how many different organisms are present by counting up all of those genomes. So it's a method called qPCR or quantitative PCR. And it's a really rapid, nice molecular diagnostic technique because it quickly allows you to say, is the pathogen present? And then if so, how much of it is there? Is there a lot of it on a frog or does it only have just a little tiny amount that's probably not doing much of anything? And so we started out by looking at sort of three sentinel amphibian species that we had lots of sampling throughout the southeastern United States. We looked at uh, one newt species and then we looked at two different tree frog species. And I'm actually only going to show you results for this little green tree frog down at the bottom because the other two species didn't have any BD at all. So after we had looked at those species, we thought, okay, maybe this pathogen is not even here. Then we looked at the ornate chorus frog. And we found a whole lot of BD infection. So if you look at the map up at the top, this is showing you all of our frog populations that we sampled throughout the southeastern US. And all of the red wedges of the pies are showing you the uh, percentage of, of frogs that had BD, that were infected with this pathogen. And you can see that it was most of our populations and the ones that were infected, it was at least a quarter, if not more of the individuals. So this was actually highlighting quite a bit of BD going on in this species. Um, and if you look at the bar plot on the right, what this is showing you is in all of our infected populations, we measure what we call the BD intensity, which is how much of the pathogen is on the skin of these animals. Is it dozens, hundreds, thousands, millions? And what I have here in the red line is showing you the 10,000 zoospore threshold, because that's kind of a line that we've established in the literature, that if frogs have more than about 10,000 of these organisms present on a sample of their skin, that is indicative that they are not resistant to this disease at all, and that in fact, it's causing chytridiomycosis, and that it may lead to uh, high rates of, of declines. And so, because in almost all of our populations, pretty much every infected individual is way above that threshold, we think there might be what we call cryptic chytridiomycosis going on here in Florida and in the Southeast, where we're not seeing the obvious effects of this disease. Um, and yet, because there isn't a ton of monitoring going on for a lot of these species, there might be major declines going on that we actually just haven't um, been able to directly observe because we haven't been looking. Now that we're looking, this is leading us to additional studies. So um, we're looking at a number of different species now. There are thousands of potential hosts here in the Southeast, so it's a big scale problem. But we decided to do one really detailed, fine scale study so that in that one small region, we could at least get a good handle on what was going on. And so we decided to focus on Jekyll Island, a very small contained barrier island off the coast of Southern Georgia. Some of you may have visited there. It's a great vacation spot. There's lots of sea turtles to be seen there. And it's an area where we were able to extensively sample pretty much every amphibian population on the island. So there are four species that occur in high abundances on Jekyll Island shown in the pictures here. Um, so we have a number of different tree frog species and a leopard frog. And the pie charts, again, are showing you what's going on with BD infections. And so here the black wedges are the ones that are showing uh, the BD infected percent of individuals. And so you can see it's not as widespread as our previous study. There are actually quite a number of populations that are not infected at all, but some populations do have some proportion of individuals that have BD. And in fact, when we look across the four species that we sampled, we saw that this was actually being very strongly driven by this one species down at the bottom, the invasive greenhouse tree frog. And so this actually highlights the potential of invasive amphibian species to be the drivers of spreading these pathogens to new areas. And so we've uh, focused quite a bit in the last couple of years now on looking at invasive compared to uh, native species to see how much that's driving this problem. 
So now I want to move on to my second example study, and we're going to move completely to the opposite end of the susceptibility scale. So we're going to look at a species that has extremely high chytridiomycosis susceptibility. And so this is looking at some of the research that I started as a grad student in the southwestern United States. And uh, I want to tell you about some species differences and trying to understand whether or not genetic differences can explain those differences in susceptibility. So the first species I'm going to tell you about is Rana chiricoensis, the Chiricahua leopard frog. This is a species that we know has been declining very severely from BD, dating all the way back to the 1970s. Most of the populations have been uh, extirpated, which means the local population goes extinct. And because this is such a big problem in this species, this it, species has been federally listed as threatened and there's a lot of management actions to try to keep it from going extinct. In contrast, we can look at another very closely related species that also occurs in the southwestern United States, Rana yavapayensis, which is commonly known as the lowland leopard frog. And in this case, yes, this species has some susceptibility, so it's not, it's not completely on the resistant side of the scale, but it's also not completely susceptible. So this species has been declining for the same amount of time since the 1970s. There have been some isolated populations that have gone extinct, but as a whole, it's doing okay. Populations are surviving in the presence of BD. It's not federally listed. And so we really wanted to know what could explain these differences. So here's a map of Arizona showing you all of the populations of these two species that we sampled. So that federally threatened, very heavily declining species is shown in purple and where we sampled those purple populations. And then the lowland leopard frog, the less susceptible species is shown in yellow. Again, as always, the pie charts, the, the gray area here shows you the percent of individuals that have BD infections. And I'm showing you this just to highlight that it's really variable. There's a lot of BD, but it's, it's quite variable where some populations have none, others have a lot, others are in the middle. And that's true for both species. So the way that we went about um, asking this question about whether genetics could explain this pattern is that we looked at a group of immune genes that are called major histocompatibility histo complex or MHC genes for short. So MHC genes are really critical immune system genes. They are hallmarks of having a memory immune response. So we humans have MHC genes and frogs have MHC genes and fish and bats and anything with a backbone has this group of genes. And they're very famous in terms of looking at disease genetics because they're known to be extremely variable. There are lots of different flavors of MHC genes and they perform this key role that's illustrated by this diagram that you're looking at. So MHC molecules, sit on the surface of what we call antigen presenting cells, T cells, B cells, those immune system cells that are critical for triggering an immune response. And the only way that you can actually get an immune response happening is if you have a MHC molecule that binds on to a fragment of a pathogen and recognizes it as a foreign organism that should be destroyed. And if that happens, then that MHC molecule will go and interact with T and B cells and trigger them to stimulate a memory immune response. If you don't have that interaction with MHC molecules, then you cannot have any kind of strong acquired immune response to any pathogen. And so we kind of call it the gatekeeper of immunity in these, these types of disease systems. So what I did with my leopard frog species is I sequenced the genes that code for these MHC molecules and I compared how many flavors of MHC genes do you get in the species that's nearly gone extinct compared to the species that's doing really okay. So again, we've got our purple species in the left, the Chiricahua leopard frog that is severely declined from BD shown on the top. And then below that, we've got the lowland leopard frog that's really the one that's doing okay. Now what I did is I looked at, uh, a couple of hundred of, indiv hundred of individuals from each species looked at 12 different populations of the really threatened species. In fact, those are really the 12 only populations left. And then we just looked at kind of a random selection of eight different populations of the species that's doing fine. So it actually has dozens and dozens of populations left. And we just took kind of like a handful of those populations for the purposes of comparison. comparison. 
Then we looked at the total number of MHC alleles or different genetic flavors that we recovered and we compared it. And it's a really simple result, but I think it sticks out pretty nicely to highlight what we found, which is that there are only five different flavors of these genes in the very severely threatened species that's nearly gone extinct. Whereas we have 84 and counting, this is only from eight populations, we've actually looked at more and we've nearly doubled that number, but five compared to 84 different flavors. Uh, if we look at the level of population in any given Chiricahua leopard frog population, there were only one or two alleles present in the whole population. Whereas in the less susceptible species, we had typically nine or more alleles present in a given population. So there's a massive difference in this immune system genetic variation that we know is really important for being able to recognize a lot of different pathogens. And so we think this might be linked to why there's so much more susceptibility in one species. We wanted to take this work a step further, right? Because in this very threatened species, there's not a lot of MHC genetic variation left. But the question we wanted to ask is of the variation that's left, is it still actually important for what happens with these frogs? Because one scenario could be that even though most of the immunogenetic variation is gone, the little bit that's left has stuck around because it's actually really valuable. So we did a natural experiment where we asked the question, does the MHC flavor that a frog has predict whether or not it survives over winter in a natural habitat? So what you're looking at is the very pond that we released these frogs to. It was a place that used to have Chiricahua leopard frogs. They went extinct. And so we were able to raise some leopard frogs at the Phoenix Zoo where they have a great husbandry facility. And after we raised them up and they metamorphosed into frogs, we were able to release them back to what we knew to be a good habitat for this species. And the reason why we look at survival over winter is because winter is the only time where this disease, chytridiomycosis, is a problem for frogs in Arizona. In the summer, it is way too hot for the fungus to grow and it kind of just sits latent. And then in fall and then going into winter is when we see these big die-off events happening. So by looking at survival over winter, it was kind of a proxy for how uh, much the MHC flavor enabled the frog to survive BD or not survive BD. So on the next slide, I'm showing you what we found. Um, we looked at just under 200 individuals that we released into this pond in, in the fall, in October. And before we, re we released them, we sequenced their MHC genes. And so we knew every flavor that every frog had. In fact, there were only two different flavors possible. And so we were just comparing two different categories of MHC type one to MHC type two. And then we resampled these frogs every month after releasing them at, in, in the following spring to see which ones survived through the winter and were still there in spring. And every frog that we recaptured, we genotyped again, we sequenced the MHC again, and we said, okay, what is the flavor that we're recovering among the survivors? And so the chart here is showing you the two different flavors possible. There were individuals on the left that only had the flavor number eight, and then individuals on the right had two flavors. They had both three and eight combined in the same individual. And what you can see is that our proportion of recapture shows you that we only ever recaptured one flavor. And we never recaptured an individual that had the other flavor at all. And so because of this really strong pattern, we actually now have more evidence to say this, this low amount of MHC variation is still really important. And there are certain of these variants that seem to be helping at least some of these frogs still survive this global pandemic fungal disease. And so this gives us some hope that even though we've lost a lot of this species, the genetic lineages that remain do have some degree of resistance and might be able to kind of repopulate uh, their native habitats in Arizona. Okay, so moving on to my third and final example for today's talk, I wanna to talk to you about some fine scale differences in the specific immune responses and immune genetics that we're seeing within members of the same species. 
So these species comparisons are great to give you the bigger, broader picture of what's happening. But when we really want to understand what is the specific mechanism that allows one frog to survive and a another frog to die of this disease, that's where it's really useful to look at individuals that are members of the same species and even occurring in the exact same populations and experiencing the same habitats. And so for this work, we went back to this the second species, the less susceptible Arizona leopard frog species, the lowland leopard frog, because it is one of those species that shows a lot of variation in terms of one individual to the next having very, very different susceptibilities. So the, the first major study that I did looking at immune responses in the species is where we did a method that I call expression profiling the response to BD. And what I mean by expression profiling is that we looked at not just one gene, not just the MHC, but we actually took all of the genes being expressed and we measured which genes are being ramped up, meaning you're making more of those gene products and which ones are being cranked down, meaning you're turning them off because making them is not, is not what you want to be doing under the, the conditions that you're experiencing. And so what I'm showing you here is a what we call a egg mass or a clutch of frog eggs. And I'm showing you this to highlight that in order to do these types of gene expression studies, you have to control the environment very tightly because genes getting turned on and off changes all the time, moment to moment, depending on what the environment is that you're experiencing, right? It's a fairly warm day today. If tomorrow's cooler, I'm gonna have a different gene expression profile than I did the day before. So the way that we do this research to try to really hone in on just what is driving BD susceptibility is we collect egg masses, freshly laid eggs, and then we immediately bring them into the lab and we grow all of these frogs in a completely common environment where they're experiencing the same temperature, the same light and dark, the same amount and types of food so that there's very little environmental differences. And then what we do is after they turn into frogs, we put them in different treatment groups and some of those frogs get exposed to a deadly strain of BD and other frogs do not. And we compare what are the differences in gene expression in the frogs that get exposed compared to the ones that don't to see what is the immune response to this pathogen specifically. So we did this study. This chart represents a year plus effort of a lot of uh, raising frogs and conducting very controlled experiments. But what you're seeing in the top chart is the different colors are showing you these different clutches or egg masses of frogs that we collected in Arizona, shipped them to the lab, and then raised them up for months until they became frogs, infected them with BD, and the y-axis here is showing you what percentage of those frogs developed chytridiomycosis, developed those disease signs that we know mean that they're susceptible and they're dying of this disease. And you can see that for all four clutches, some of the animals did develop chytridiomycosis, but it wasn't all of them. Within each clutch, we still had variation where some of the frogs were surviving it and others were not. And then another very important thing is that we had those control frogs from all four clutches that didn't get infected at all. And that's the flat line on the bottom showing you none of them got sick, which is good news because they didn't have BD, so there, there was no reason why they should. That's an important control that our experimental design was working the way that it should. So then on the bottom panel, panel B, what you're seeing is that, that molecular diagnostic where we measured actually how much BD was present on the skin of these infected individuals across all four clutches. And what you can see is that over the days post-infection with BD, the infection intensity goes up, which is what you would expect, right? At first it's low, and then as the fungus grows and colonizes the skin, it goes up and up and up. And across the board, it stayed high on average for all four of these genetic groups of frogs. However, in panel C, what you're seeing is that the frogs that survived until the, the late stages of infection, when we sampled those frogs and we compared the ones that had no disease at all to the ones that actually were displaying all of these signs shown in the upper picture, you can see frogs, they can't stand up, they get really red, their, their skin starts to slough off, they stop eating. 
if we compare how much BD those two groups of individuals had, the ones that were dying of this disease actually had significantly more BD, and the ones that were surviving were actually uh, lowering their burdens. They were limiting how much BD was enabling, was allowed to grow on their skin. So we do see some functional difference there. Okay, so now on to the gene expression profiling. So I know it's a lot to look at. That's how these kind of genome scale studies go. But this is where we implemented a new genomic technique called RNA-seq, where we basically take all of the RNA that is present in a tissue of a frog. And that RNA is the intermediary between the DNA, which is your genome, and the protein, which is taking that blueprint and turning into something that actually functions. So taking the gene for MHC and making it into an actual MHC protein that can go and bind to pathogens. So the step in between that actually translates the DNA to the protein is the RNA. So when you sequence it, it's a proxy for which genes are being turned on and which ones are being turned off. And the colors here are showing you that when you see a lot of red, that's when the, the gene is being cranked way up and you're producing a lot of it. And when you see blue, that's when the gene is being cranked down and you're seeing very little of it, or in some cases, it's shut off entirely. And so we looked at a few different tissues. I'm showing you results for the spleen because that is the major immune tissue of frogs, and that's where we saw the strongest response. And so the way to look at this chart is that you're looking at all of the immune gene differences. So we've got acquired immune function, which is you know, your memory response, like your MHC genes. We've got inflammatory responses, which are really important for uh, responding to pathogens. And then we've got innate immune mechanisms, which are, are more those simple, immediate, generic responses. And if you look and compare our control frogs that had no BD to very early infection stages when the infections are just building up, and then if we compare those frogs that were surviving, limiting their BD, not getting sick, to the susceptible individuals that had tons of BD and were getting really sick with chytridiomycosis, you can see broadly a major difference, which is with that the frogs that were dying have a whole lot of red of all of these immune genes, and the frogs that are surviving are very, very blue. They're shutting down their immune gene expression. This was very surprising to us. So I had hypothesized going into this that having a really strong, robust immune response is actually what was going to lead to survival. That's how you're gonna fight off BD. This is the complete opposite pattern. This is saying that if you crank up your immune response, that's what's associated with actually dying from this disease. And if you really ramp down your immune gene expression, those are the frogs that are surviving. So this was a really remarkable pattern that we, that we found, and it did surprise us at first, but the more that we thought about it, we, we kind of realized, okay, this interaction matters. These MHC genes that are showing this pattern and all these other immune genes, um, this is really important, but it's not happening in the way that we thought. So we thought activating these genes was gonna be really good for kicking off really beneficial immune responses, but instead now we think, those immune responses are actually not that beneficial. And there's another line of evidence to kind of support this alternative hypothesis, which is that um, some other researchers looking at the genome of the BV fungus itself found that it's actually functionally an immunosuppressive pathogen, kind of like something like HIV, meaning that it targets immune cells. And so it is actually able to secrete something from the skin that causes those B and T cells to undergo apoptosis and be destroyed. So the fact that activating an immune response is generating a lot of the cell types that this BD fungus is really good at destroying kind of means you're maybe just adding fuel to the fire and that you're better off trying to limit those types of responses and focus on alternative mechanisms like skin shedding, which we see a lot of, um, which might be more beneficial. So just one final um, avenue of research that this has led to, now that we looked at expression of all of these genes, we also just wanted to do genomic comparisons. So we're using a new and really cool technique called sequence capture, which basically is a molecular method where you can capture off in the space of the genome, which has billions of base pairs of DNA, right? Tons and tons of nucleotides coding for all sorts of things you're able to just target in on the functional genes and get rid of kind of all of the intermediary stuff that doesn't do all that much. 
And so by doing this, we're able to pretty efficiently get at the functional component of the genome and look at what's going on in terms of not just one set of genes or not just the immune genes, but all of the genes. And so we again went to Arizona and sampled uh, some of the same populations that we've been looking at for a few decades now. And the different populations are shown in different colors. And then on the right, what you're seeing is what's called a principal component analysis, where we took all of the genetic variation across thousands and thousands of different genes. And we use that to cluster all the individuals from these populations into genome space. And so basically, if you're in a different area of genome space, that means you have really different genetic variation than any other population. And so one really interesting thing that we're seeing here is that if you look to the map on the left, all of the northern populations in the cool colors are clustering pretty closely together. And all of these southern populations are really separating out. And in the south is where BD is a lot worse. We have a lot more disease and have had a lot more severe declines. And so that kind of corresponds with a lot of different genetic differentiation going on among those different populations. So this is just kind of characterizing the pattern. The final thing that we did, um, which is one of the most exciting things that we've done so far, is we took all of that genetic variation, we took all of these frogs, and we said, okay, they all have different amounts of BD. Some have none, some have a little bit, some have a lot. And we did a correlation analysis where we asked, is there an association between having certain genetic variation in certain parts of your genome and having a really high amount of BD or having a really low amount of BD? And so what you're looking at is what's called a Manhattan plot. It's an output of this type of analysis. And it's an analysis that's actually named for the fact that it looks like the Manhattan skyline. So just like when you're looking at a cityscape, you see some tall buildings that stick way up into the sky and others that are much lower. With a Manhattan plot, you look at all of your genetic variation across all of your chromosomes of your, in this case, frog genomes. And then the y-axis is showing you the p-value of the association and how strong of a relationship there is between the genetic variation you have in that part of the genome and the characteristic that you're interested in. So in this case, when we see anything above this blue line, those are the outliers that are the, the biggest skyscrapers that are showing extremely strong associations between having certain genetic variants and having really high or really low amounts of BD. And the really exciting thing is that when we look at those outliers are when we just look at all of the different genes, in fact, all of them happen to be immune system genes. One of them is an MHC gene. And so it kind of reinforces what we thought all along, which is that it's the immune response that's key for, for what's going on here. OK, so uh, those are the stories that, that uh, kind of encapsulate the, the main research I've done here at UCF over the past five years that I've been here. And so I want to move on to dessert where, you know, take in, taking the specific studies that I've done and then just wildlife disease research in general, I want to give you what are my data-driven takeaways that can maybe give us some hope for the future in terms of how we address and mitigate both human and wildlife disease concerns. So a couple of take-home messages from my research. The first is that we're seeing a situation that has a lot of complexity, but also some commonality. And what I mean by that is every single frog species we look at, the ones I've looked at, the one others amphibian biologists have looked at, they all have unique genetics, unique ecology, unique immunity, and a bunch of other factors that interact to just determine disease outcomes. There are other gene expression studies that find totally different patterns from what I've found. So there's definitely no magic bullet solution, right? It would be nice if we could say, this is the gene, this is the thing we have to do, it will save all the frogs. That's just not the reality. It's, it's, diseases are complex. However, on the flip side, this is true for all species, not just frogs, but humans and all wildlife, that it's complex and you always have to think about these interacting factors of the ecology and the different pathogen landscape and the microbiome. This pertains to all of us. So it's something that we can compare across systems, humans included, and in fact, many of the factors and even the genes that we're identifying as being really important are shared, both between different frog species and humans and frogs. B12 
These MHC genes are really important for disease susceptibility in humans, just like they are in frogs, just like they are in other taxa. And so there are some ways that we can really integrate this type of research. My take home message number two is that my work adds to a body of work that shows that there's a pattern emerging among the cold blooded organisms that we more formally call ectotherms. And what this means is just the organisms that cannot maintain their own body temperature like we mammals do, but instead rely on what the environmental temperature is to dictate what their internal body temperature would be. So we don't like to say cold blooded because it kind of implies that there's something negative about the frogs and toads and lizards and fish. But when it comes to these types of organisms, the pattern that we're seeing is way above what we're just seeing across all wildlife. There is a pattern of really severe emerging infectious diseases across ectothermic vertebrates. So I've talked to you today about BD and how it's the biggest threat to global biodiversity ever. Huge problem. But it's not the only one. Ronavirus is also a viral disease of amphibians and turtles and fish that's causing major problems in the last couple of decades. We have a new disease in snakes called snake fungal disease. I know some people hate snakes, but they're really important and this is highly concerning. Um, we have a, a disease in sea turtles. It's quite severe here in Florida called fibropapillomatosis. It's a tumor disease linked to a virus. Uh, tortoises, including gopher tortoises here in Florida, have upper respiratory tract disease that's been ongoing and severe for a couple of decades. And then, although bats are mammals, they're warm-blooded, they're not cold-blooded, weight-nose syndrome has emerged and it's been catastrophic for bats. And when bats get weight-nose, it's when they're functioning like ectotherms. It's when they're hibernating and dependent on environmental temperature. So I think a big takeaway here is that we know there's been rapid changes to uh, climate and to global temperatures. And these diseases are particularly problematic in organisms that are dependent on those environmental temperatures for things like immune function. So I think we really need to consider these ectothermic diseases as maybe not as direct a threat to infecting humans, but more something that is a harbinger of what is going on in the environment in general and what some of those consequences are. Okay, so some future directions first of my specific research. Um, I am moving with all of the work that we've done looking at genomic variation and genomic associations to taking my leopard frog species that I've been studying and now moving on to a new technique you may have heard of called CRISPR-Cas9 genome editing. This is a fairly new technique that has really revolutionized genetics and that has enabled us to go in into the genome of pretty much any organism and go to the gene of interest and either destroy it or change it and then see what the direct function of that gene product is. So now that I have these candidate immune genes that are associating with disease, I'm going to attempt to destroy them one by one, edit them out of the genome of individual frogs, and then redo these experimental infections to directly infer what is the consequence of having a certain gene or not having. So that's kind of an exciting new direction that I think will give us maybe some specific uh, targets in terms of how to, to manage and conserve these species in the future. Now, more broadly, in terms of the future's directions for wildlife disease research in general, of course, it all comes back to COVID. So there's a ton of both scientific uh, research articles, opinion pieces, popular press articles, kind of talking about this issue now. I just pulled a couple of headlines and quotes of how habitat destruction enables the spread of diseases like COVID-19. Wildlife habitat destruction and deforestation will cause more deadly pandemics like coronavirus, scientists warn. So um, if we look at some of the quotes of more specifically, you know, why people are making these claims, preserving habitats for wildlife and preserving our world is a human health issue, say some leading epidemiologists. Kind of more specifically, Dr. Aaron Sills kind of explains that when you have people that get displaced into natural habitats, because they don't have good, good alternatives of where to live, they come into more direct contact with a wider range of wildlife. This creates the conditions where we're likely to see more of these diseases emerge. So I think COVID-19 has impacted all of us globally in pretty much any way we can think of, but one of those ways is that it has really been a call to action for wildlife disease research and for this One Health 
concept being prioritized. So what I would like to leave you with is that I think a silver lining of, of COVID-19 is that it has been a really powerful motivator for us to prioritize One Health research. And I do see that we will see a lot more funding and a lot more focus on these types of research efforts going forward. And so with that, I would like to say thank those of you who hung in for this presentation. Um, I wish, you know, that at this point I could open the floor for questions. Of course, we, we can't do it with this pre-record. Um, but please, my email's at the bottom here. Reach out if you're interested in a follow-up conversation. And of course, I would like to thank UCF, my funding agencies, members of my lab who did a lot of the research that I highlighted today, and then my, my uh, international group of collaborators that all work on these important wildlife disease systems, and then of course my family. I'd like to thank you so much for your time, and I'm gonna uh, close the presentation and uh, stop my screen share and then stop the recording. So thank you all very much. Um, I hope to be interacting with some of you in person in the near future. Take care all, stay safe.